in this lecture we're going to talk about mass storage systems. So <clears throat> normally when you think of mass storage systems you think of either magnetic disks or um, SSDs. These days SSDs are much more prominent and are on the rise. Now when you have a magnetic disk or a hard drive as you're just talking about it, uh, it rotates anywhere from 60 to 250 times per second. The transfer rate is the rate at which data flows between the drive and the computer. Also, there's a positioning time, which is the time to move the disk arm to the desired cylinder. It's called the seek time, and the time for the desired se sector to rotate under the disk, so it's rotational latency. You can also have experience a head crash, which can result from the disk drive making contact with the disk platter, the head making contact with the disk. That is considered bad. Um, you can have removable disks. They are typically attached to a computer via an I.O. bus, and there are several types of different uh, buses. Uh, the most common these days are um, SATA uh, um, and SAS, I believe. There's usually a host controller in the computer that uses the bus to talk to the disk controller uh, built into the drive. Um, typically, the host controller is now part of the motherboard on most PCs, for example. So here's a visual. Uh, basically, we see our we've got a track, a spindle, we've got our arm, a sector, a collection of sectors, our selection of uh, tracks called a cylinder, and our actual platter. So for performance of a hard drive. It, access latency equals average access time equals seek time plus average latency. Now we're not going to go into a lot of calculations here because when we have solid state drives, which is much more common, um, they can be more reliable. They are also more expensive and they have shorter lifespans because they have a limited number of writes. However, that is improving every day. Um, they are considerably faster and often have to connect directly to uh, PCI as opposed to using a bus. There are no moving parts, so there's no seek time or rotational la latency, so that makes things much simpler. Before that, we had magnetic tape, which is only used these days for very large installations for backing stuff up, but they're not really used for anything else. So when we do have a disk, um, we consider it as a large one-dimensional array, of logical blocks where the logical block is the smallest unit of transfer. Low-level formatting creates logical blocks on physical media. The one-dimensional array of logical blocks is mapped onto the actual sectors of the disk sequentially. Sector 0 is the first sector of the first track on the outermost cylinder. Mapping proceeds in order through that track, then the rest of the tracks in that cylinder, and through the rest of the cylinders. Logical to physical addresses should be easy, except when we have bad sectors. You can also have uh, what's called a storage array. Uh, you can just attach disks or arrays of disks, and there's typically a controller. This is a separate unit, and their ports are connected to host an array. There's memory controlling software and it can be up to a from a few to a few thousand disks concepts such as raid which we'll talk about uh, help ensure redundancy and reliability as well as spares and hot swaps um, a storage area network is another option common in large storage environments multiple hosts are attached to multiple storage arrays uh, via various mechanisms a storage area network is one or more storage arrays connected usually by fiber channel because it's very fast and are also attached to the switch so they can be hit from the network. Um, a network attached storage is storage made available over a network rather than over a local connection and they remotely attach to a file system. NFS and CIFS are common protocols for this. Usually this is implemented via remote procedure calls. So disk scheduling, just like memory uh, scheduling and, or process scheduling. The operating system is responsible for using hardware efficiently. For disk drives, this means having a fast access time. In regular hard drives, as opposed to SSDs, we want to minimize seek time. 
um, disk bandwidth is the total number of bytes transferred divided by the total time between the first request for service and the completion of the last transfer. When SSDs are used, the seek time is essentially zero. Um, so there are many sources of disk I.O. requests from the OS, from a system process, or from a user process. I.O. requests include input or output mode, disk address, memory address, number of sectors to transfer. The, IO, the OS maintains a queue of requests. Idle disk can immediately work on an I.O. request. Busy disk must be queued. Uh, optimization algorithms only make sense when a queue exists. So for disk scheduling, notice that drive controllers have small buffers and can manage a queue of requests. There are algorithms that exist to schedule the servicing of I.O. requests. The analysis is true for one or more platters. And here's a simple example with a um, hard drive. You have to move from here to here all over the place. Whereas with an SSD, you can access them directly. So one of the methods when dealing with hard drives is to pick a job like single short or shortest seek time first and um, basically it finds the shortest job um, and pulls exercise that first now it does leave you open to things like starvation there are other algorithms as well um, but this is one of the many first come first curve is the most common disk management Low-level formatting or physical forming, dividing a disk into sectors that the disk controller can read and write. Each sector can hold header information plus data plus error correction codes. Usually 512 bytes is used, but they can be selectable or different. To use a disk to hold files, the OS still needs to record its own structure on top of the disk. You will partition the disk into one or more groups of cylinders. Each can be treated as a logical drive and then you logically format it or make it a file system. To increase efficiency, most file systems group blocks into clusters. This allows us to do uh, disk I.O. is done in blocks, but file I.O. can be done in larger clusters. Raw disk access for apps uh, is often used for apps that want to do it their own way. Uh, databases are a really good example. There is also a boot block which initializes the system. The bootstrap block is stored in ROM. When the bootstrap loader with the first party OS runs, uh, it's stored in a boot block of a boot partition. And then there are, and that's what's used to load in like the operating system. Memory methods such as sector sparing are used to handle bad blocks. So here's how in Windows we boot from a disk. We have our master boot record and our various partitions. We've got in the master boot is our boot code uh, and it references our partition table. And from here, it'll tell us where to find our boot partition, which is what we actually boot off of. Sometimes you have to use swap space and virtual memory uses disk space, disk space as an extension of main memory. These days, it's getting less common because of large main memories. It can be carved out of a normal file system or more commonly put in its own partition. Swap space management is uh, done in multiple ways. Uh, BSD allocates swap space when the process starts and it holds a text segment of the program and data segment in the swap space. The kernel uses swapping maps to go back and forth. So here's an example of the data structure for swapping on Linux. We've got a partition file uh, and a swap map. And the map indicates where it is on the actual drive. So now we're going to talk a little bit about RAID. RAID stands for Redundant Array of Inexpensive Disks. Multiple disk drives provide reliability versus via redundancy. Uh, it increases the mean time to failure. Um, so there's a couple concepts we need to decline. Mean time to repair is the exposure time when another failure could cause data loss. Mean time to data loss is based on the above factors. If mirrored disks fail independently, consider a disk dive with uh, 1.3 million mean time to failure and a 10 hour mean time to repair. So using that idea, um, the mean time to data loss is really large. If we combine this with NVRAM, we can non-volatile RAM, we can improve performance. 
there's a couple concepts in uh, RAID that are used often. There's striping, it's used a group of disks as a single storage unit, and there are six levels of RAID. Um, they improve storage performance and improve the reliability of the storage system by storing redundant data. The simplest form is mirroring, mirroring RAID 1, which keeps a duplicate of each disk. Stripe mirrors um, or mirrored stripes provide high performance and high reliability. Um, there's also block interleave parity, and but it uses much less redundancy. RAID within a storage array can still fail if the array as a whole fails. So automatic replication of the data between multiple arrays is common. This can get pretty expensive. Frequently a small number of hot spare disks are left unallocated, automatically replacing a failed disk and having data rebuilt onto them. So here's a diagram of some of the different types of RAID. We've got RAID 0, which is nothing. RAID 1, we mirror the disks. It's a copy. Here we uh, stripe our memory into error correcting co codes. Um, in RAID 3, we have a single drive which controls uh, the uh, bit interleave parity for each other drive. Um, and then we have block interleaved. And then uh, here we go to distributed parity, where it's distributed across all the distance that are just one. And then we have it with uh, both redundancy and um, parity drives. Regardless of where RAID is implemented, other useful features can be added. A snapshot uh, is an idea that can be used. Uh, and replication is automatic duplication of writes between separate sites for redundancy and disaster recovery. It can be synchronous or asynchronous, which is also known as a visual, eventual consistency. There is a hot spare disk that can be unused and automatically used by RAID if production fails to replace the failed disk and rebuild RAID. This does in, in decrease the mean time to repair. RAID alone does not prevent or detect data corruption or others, just disk failures, that's it. Operating systems often have their own extensions to RAID to provide better protection. Another option is traditional and pooled storage. Traditional is everything is its own system. Pooled storage is where basically you share all your drives across a pool and uh, have both the benefits and risks thereof. Another option is what's called stable storage implementation. This is right ahead log scheme and it requires stable storage. Stable storage means data is never lost due to a failure. We need to replicate information on one or more non-volatile storage medias with independent failure modes. They can't be dependent on each other. And we update the information in a controlled manner to ensure that we can recover the stable data after any failure. A disk write in this case has one of three outcomes. Successful completion, the disk was data was written correctly on disks. Um, partial failure, where a failure occurred in the midst of transfers, only some of the sectors were written with the new data, and the sector being written during the failure may have been corrupted. And then there's a total failure, nothing gets written. If failure occurs during block write, recovery procedures restores the block to a consistent state. The system maintains two physical blocks per logical block, and it does the following. It writes to one physical slot, and when that's successful, it does the second write. And it only considers of complete after both are complete. This um, often uses NVRAM to improve performance. Basically, we double our space usage, but we stabilize our safety. 